Dear friends, I now have the very great privilege of introducing you to Professor Firuz Kazemzadeh, who will greet, greet us and address us concerning the topic, the beloved Abdu Baha, the center of the covenant of Baha'u'llah. Please join me in welcoming Professor Kazemzadeh. Friends, Allah Abha, 100 years have passed since the ascension of Baha'u'llah. In only one century, his faith has spread over the globe more widely than has any other religion save Christianity, which is almost 2,000 years old. But unlike other religions, the Baha'i faith in its rapid expansion has retained the purity of its doctrine and the unity of its followers. What was the distinguishing characteristic that has allowed the Baha'i faith to spread virtually to every country in the world, to be embraced by members of every race, nationality, culture, and religion, yet preserve the integrity of its teachings and the oneness of its community. That characteristic was Baha'u'llah's covenant. Messengers of God, when they appear, renew the essential teachings of earlier faiths, bring new laws, and release enormous spiritual energies that transform lives create communities, and lead to the emergence of new civilizations. Yet the invisible power released by divine revelation and flowing through God's messengers also makes it possible for spiritually untransformed human beings to misuse it, turn it to their selfish ends, and pervert its purpose. Two issues fraught with grave dangers confronted the followers of religions of the past the moment their inspired founders left this world. The two issues were authority and interpretation. When Jesus died on the cross, who among the small band of his disciples was the leader? Who was to guide the community and interpret the teachings left by the departed Lord? And when years later those teachings were at last recorded for posterity, who was to determine which recollections of Christ's words and deeds were authentic and which were not? When Muhammad died, who was his lawful successor? who indeed had an indisputable right to be called Amir al-Mu'minin, commander of the faithful. As Christianity and Islam spread, they split into sects over questions of doctrine and leadership because, like religions that had preceded them, they possessed no firmly established principle of succession and of authoritative interpretation of their scriptures. Sectarianism led to strife that forever divided the believers. In religion, interpretation and authority are inseparable because the sacred scriptures are not only a map to the path of individual salvation, but also contain commandments, laws, and rules that regulate the life of society. Therefore, he who explicates the scriptures 
and interprets the teachings will inevitably exercise authority in the community. No religion of the past had succeeded in resolving this thorny yet vital issue. The Baha'i faith is the first world religion that contains clear provisions for succession to the leadership of its founder and resolves the twin issues of authority and interpretation. Humanity has evolved. The great challenge confronting it in this age is to overcome division and to unite mankind in a single organic whole, which of course cannot be accomplished without solving the problem of authority. In this weighty and incomparable document, Shoghi Effendi, guardian of the cause, writes, that is the book of Abdul Baha's covenant, its author discloses the character of that excellent and priceless heritage bequeathed by him to his heirs. To guard it, and these are now my own words again, to preserve it and to pass it to future generations and to ensure the unity of the believers, Baha'u'llah in that will and testament appointed Abdul Baha the center of the covenant and the authorized interpreter of his father's teachings. This year, as we commemorate the 100th anniversary of Baha'u'llah's passing, we also celebrate the covenant and the person of Abdul Baha, its embodiment and center. Baha'u'llah's covenant is a phenomenon unique in religious history. Abdul Baha himself has testified that from the early days of creation down to the present time, throughout all the divine dispensations, such a firm and explicit covenant has not been entered upon. Equally as unique as the covenant itself was its center. In the book of my covenant, Baha'u'llah proclaims, and you have already heard this quotation today, there has branched from the Sadrat al-Montaha this sacred and glorious being, this branch of holiness. Well is it with him that hath sought his shelter and abideth beneath its shadow. As Baha'u'llah prepared to ascend to the realm above, he knew that, to quote the guardian again, his stupendous task on this earthly plane had been brought to its final consummation. The message with which he had been entrusted had been disclosed to the gaze of all mankind. Above all, the covenant that was to perpetuate the influence of the faith, ensure its integrity, safeguard it from schism, and stimulate its worldwide wild expansion had been fixed on an inviolable basis. His own beloved son, the apple of his eye, his vicegerent on earth, the executive of his authority, the pivot of his covenant, the shepherd of his flock, the exemplar of his faith, the image of his perfection the majesty of his revelation, the interpreter of his mind, the architect of his world order, the ensign of his most great peace, the focal point of his unerring guidance, in a word, the occupant of an office without peer or equal in the entire field of religious history, stood guard over it, alert, fearless, and determined to enlarge its limits, blazon abroad its fame, champion its interests, and consummate its purpose. Thus wrote Shoghi Effendi. 
Abdul Baha was born in Tehran on May 23, 1844, on the night the Bab declared his mission to Mullah Hussein in Shiraz. His childhood was happy but brief. He had not yet reached the age of nine when in the summer of 1852 a storm burst upon the Babi community of which his father was a prominent and admired leader. Soon thousands of Babis would fall victim to the cruel fanaticism of the clerical and secular authorities of a corrupt and barbarous regime. Baha'u'llah was thrown into the Siyah Chal, the Black Pit, a dark subterranean dungeon. Abdul Baha visited his father there and retained for the rest of his life the, I quote again, ineffable vision of a father, haggard, disheveled, freighted with chains. Neighborhood boys now made Abdul Baha the object of their malice, pelted him with stones, vilified him, and overwhelmed him with ridicule. There followed exile and Abdul Baha's emergence in early youth as his father's amanuensis, shield and deputy. As he grew into maturity and eventually reached old age, everyone who came into contact with him was deeply impressed with this person that displayed the most unusual combination of mind and heart, majesty and humility, gentleness and firmness, justice and mercy, involvement and detachment. We are fortunate to have accounts of meetings with Abdul Baha written by learned orientalists, government officials, artists, poets, doctors, the wealthy and the poor, believers and skeptics, followers and antagonists, but all testify to his greatness and to his irresistible charm. Edward Granville Brown, a leading British Orientalist at Cambridge, who first met Abdul Baha in Akka before Abdul Baha was appointed Center of the Covenant, writes, seldom have I seen one whose appearance impressed me more. A tall, strongly built man, holding himself straight as an arrow, with white turban and raiment, long black locks reaching almost to the shoulders, broad, powerful forehead, indicating a strong intellect combined with an unswerving will, eyes keen as a hawk's, and strongly marked but pleasing features. Such was my first impression of Abbas Afandi. Subsequent conversations with him served only to heighten the respect with which his appearance had from the first inspired me. One more eloquent of speech, more ready of argument, more apt of illustration, more intimately acquainted with the sacred books of the Jews and the Christians and the Mohammedans, could, I should think, scarcely be found. These qualities combined with a bearing at once majestic and genial made me cease to wonder at the influence and esteem which he enjoyed even beyond the circle of his father's followers. And then an early American pilgrim who reached Acre just a few years after Brown's visit, wrote, of the first meeting, I can remember neither joy nor pain nor anything that I can name. I had been carried too suddenly to too great a height. My soul had come into contact with the divine spirit and this force, so pure, so holy, so mighty, had overwhelmed me. 
We could not remove our eyes from his glorious face. We heard all that he said. We drank tea with him at his bidding. But existence seemed suspended. And when he arose and suddenly left us, we came back with a start to life. But never again, oh, never again, thank God to the same life of this earth. In the might and majesty of his presence, our fear was turned to perfect faith, our weakness into strength, our sorrow into hope, and ourselves forgotten in our love for him. The incompar incomparable person of Abdul Baha produced such a strong and lasting impression on the believers that some began to think of him as Christ returned, a messenger of God, and to attribute to him a station equal to that of Baha'u'llah. In elucidating the true station of the Master, a title used by Baha'u'llah exclusively for Abdul Baha, Shoghi Effendi grants that, I quote again, it would be indeed difficult for us who stand so close to such a tremendous figure and are drawn by the mysterious power of so magnetic a personality to obtain a clear and exact understanding of one who, not only in the dispensation of Baha'u'llah, but in the entire field of religious history, fulfills a unique station. That Abdul Baha is not a manifestation of God, that though the successor of his father, he does not occupy a cognate station, are verities which lie embedded in the specific utterances of both the founder of our faith and the interpreter of his teachings. And yet, although Abdul Baha is not the equal of Abdul Baha, of Baha'u'llah, he is, in the words of the guardian again, the center of his covenant, the interpreter of his words, the perfect exemplar of his teachings, the embodiment of every Baha'i ideal, the incarnation of every Baha'i virtue, the mainspring of the oneness of humanity, styles and titles that are implicit and find their truest, their highest and fairest expression in the appellation in the name Abdul Baha. He is, above and beyond these appellations, the mystery of God, an expression by which Baha'u'llah himself has chosen to designate him, and which indicates how in the person of Abdul Baha the incompatible characteristics of human nature and superhuman knowledge and perfection have been blended and completely harmonized. Such was Abdul Baha's humility, and so great was his determination to prevent his followers from confusing his station with that of Baha'u'llah, that he repeatedly and in the strongest terms repudiated any suggestion of equality with his glorious father. In a tablet addressed to some American Baha'is, he wrote, stressing the meaning of the title he assumed after Abdul Baha's ascension. My name is Abdul Baha. My qualification is Abdul Baha. My reality is Abdul Baha. My praise is Abdul Baha. Thraldom to the blessed perfection is my glorious and refulgent diadem. And servitude to all the human race is my perpetual religion. No name, no title, no mention, no commendation have I, nor will ever have, except Abdu'l-Baha. 
This is my longing. This is my greatest yearning. This is my eternal life. This is my everlasting glory. Although Baha'u'llah's ascension was a heavy blow to the small and struggling community of his followers, scattered in a few countries of the Middle East, Russian Central Asia and India, they found consolation in Abdul Baha, whose leadership most of them accepted with relief and joy. And now there began a new stage in the evolution of the faith under the guidance of its divinely appointed master. It moved beyond the confines of Islamic societies. A year after Baha'u'llah passed away, a Christian missionary read a paper at a session of the World Parliament of Religions in Chicago, mentioning a famous Persian sage who had expressed Christ-like sentiments which the speaker wished to share with his audience. In another year, America would have its initial troop of dedicated Baha'is, the first Western apostles of the faith. The inspiration, education, and organization of Baha'i communities in North America and in Europe were the work of Abdul Baha, who avidly followed every development in the West, engaged in constant correspondence with new believers. And as soon as the Turkish revolution released him from confinement in Palestine, undertook, pro undertook prolonged visits to the United States, Canada, and several of Western and Central European countries. The impact of Abdul Baha's journeys to the West cannot be overestimated. Some of us have had the privilege of knowing a number of early Baha'is who had experienced the presence of the Master in Chicago, in San Francisco, in Los Angeles, and here in New York. Friends, I wrote this before this morning's session when you saw some who had seen Abdul Baha when they were still little children. I will never forget the light in their eyes as they talked about the master whose influence dominated the rest of their lives. It is surely not an exaggeration to say that Abdul Baha was the builder of the Baha'i community of the United States and Canada. Abdul Baha's deeds cannot be summarized. In thousands of tablets to communities and individuals, as well in several books, he expounded, interpreted, and amplified the teachings of his father. He laid the foundation of the Baha'i administrative order. He charted the course of the expansion of the faith over the entire planet. He raised its prestige and defended it from attacks by external enemies and a handful of ambitious and unscrupulous renegades. His literary legacy, if one be permitted thus to refer to his writings, is enormous and constitutes, together with the writings of Baha'u'llah, the sacred scriptures of our faith. It includes personal correspondence or tablets to individuals, which a Persian scholar has called masterpieces of Persian epistolary genre. They are marked, he wrote, by directness, intimacy, warmth, love, humor, forbearance, and a myriad of other qualities that reveal the exemplary perfection of his personality. That legacy includes tablets addressed to individuals, tablets addressed to Baha'i communities, tablets to groups and congresses, tablets of visitations, 
visitation commemorating Baha'i heroes and martyrs, three books and treatises, discourses ranging from short talks to compilations such as memorials of the faithful and some answered questions. And last but not least, the hundreds of prayers he revealed on all occasions, prayers that are recited daily by millions of his followers in every land. The same Persian scholar to whom I have already referred writes of these prayers. He says that these partake in the fullest measure of poetic qualities. The purity and sanctity of natural imagery reveal a state of cosmic harmony. The musicality of some of them transcends limitations of language. Poetry is made to serve the ultimate goal of rising above the murmur of syllables and sounds. The emotional intensity of some of Abdul Baha's prayers, especially those that recall the sufferings of and separation from Baha'u'llah, is unrivaled. And when the appointed hour struck for Abdul Baha to join his glorious father, he left us his will and testament, the charter of the new world order, one of the fundamental documents of this faith. How poor indeed is one's capacity to tell of Abdul Baha, to describe his station, to glorify his deeds. Baha'u'llah exalted him far above our ken. But he gave us Abdul Baha, the perfect human being, the source of inspiration, of love, of consolation and comfort. He is both our closest friend and the yardstick with which we measure good and evil. He is both the exemplar and the assurance of forgiveness. He is both master and servant of the beloved of God. I know of no better words with which to conclude these remarks than the words the Master himself wrote, words that are recited or chanted every day at his resting place on Mount Carmel, words that tell us the true purpose of our existence. He is the all-glorious. O oh God, my God, lowly and tearful, I raise my suppliant hands to Thee and cover my face in the dust of that threshold of Thine, exalted above the knowledge of the learned and the praise of all that glorify Thee. Graciously look upon Thy servant, humble and lowly at Thy door, with the glances of the eye of thy mercy and immerse him in the ocean of thine eternal grace. Lord, he is a poor and lowly servant of thine, enthralled and imploring thee in tears before thy face, calling to thee and beseeching thee, saying, O Lord my God, give me thy grace to serve thy loved ones. Strengthen me in my servitude to thee. Illumine my brow with the light of adoration in the court of holiness and of prayer to thy kingdom of grandeur. Help me to be steadfast at the heavenly entrance of thy gate and aid me to be detached from all things within thy holy precincts. Lord, give me to drink from the chalice of selflessness. With its robe, clothe me, and in its ocean, immerse me. Make me as dust in the pathway of thy loved ones, 
and grant that I may offer up my soul for the earth ennobled by the footsteps of thy chosen ones in thy path, O Lord of glory in the highest. With this prayer doth thy servant call thee at dawn tide and in the night season. Fulfill his heart's desire, O Lord. Illumine his heart, gladden his bosom, kindle his light, that he may serve thy cause and thy servants. Thou art the bestower, the pitiful, the most bountiful, the gracious, the merciful, the compassionate. 